This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can voice your opinion on the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. To start things off this week, we're going to Baby LK. This week's edition, Baby LK goes to the shrink. Hey, Dr. Phil. I really don't feel like talking today. But if you've got a problem... Oh, I've got a problem, all right. I just don't feel like talking about it. What is the deal? It's all of you stupid grown-ups thinking that you know what's best for me. Uh, that's not really an answer. I have decided to run away from my foster home. This is not a good solution. That I want to go home. But this just seems so wrong to me. But I still want to go home. That environment is dangerous. Oh, in what way? At so many different levels. Well, I hate to tell you this, Dr. Phil, but that's... That child protective worker lied. Can you imagine that? Oh, I can imagine a lot of things. Can you imagine living in a house where an agency comes in and says you can't be in the same house with your kids? No, but I remember the day the agency came in and said, Baby LK, okay? you can't be in the same house with your parents. I talk about it as one of the seven worst days of your life. Yeah, well, it pisses me off. I, I know you're outraged. And I miss my mommy. It takes a while to get over having someone cut out of your life so permanently. Yeah, I know. They won't even let me see my parents. You need to ask for supervised visitation. I did, dumbass, and the worker keeps saying that we'll work on it, but it never happens. You're probably being told exactly what you want to hear. No, what I really want to hear is this. Baby, okay, we realize that we screwed up, and you can go home now. But that won't happen, and I'll never understand why I'm stuck in this stinking foster home. If accusations are made about a child being molested or a child being abused, we have to assume that it's true until it's proven otherwise. But it's not true. It was all a lie orchestrated by a vindictive neighbor who was mad at my daddy for something stupid. Don't come out and negate the whole experience by defending it and saying that he was a victim. I mean, come on. Well, what am I supposed to do? Just play into your little scam? If you've had the problem in your childhood, you've been traumatized, victimized, somebody's been violent with you. But I wasn't victimized or traumatized until they took me away, and my daddy is innocent. It was a false accusation. And I think it's terrible if somebody is falsely accused. I do. Why me, Dr. Phil? Why did this have to happen to me? And why did they have to take me away? I mean, if, if they decided, okay, you know what? You're not safe here. We're putting you in foster care. But I was safe there. You say, well, how do we know? How do we know? Because I'm telling you. Because I'm telling you. You know, it's never fun to talk about losing somebody you love. Well, what's going to happen to my daddy? And they're wanting to register as a child abuser. What does that mean? He's toast. Oh, man, this is terrible. It has such an impact because we care so much. Yeah, well, you know what I'm going to do? You feel like crying, cry. You oh, I'm done crying. You feel like screaming, scream. Not this time, buddy. You do what works for you. Yeah, well, I'm going to fight them. I'm going to fight to get back to my parents. You can wind up with results you don't want. What do you mean? I mean, it, this can spin out of control so fast, it's unbelievable. So what? I'm going to kick me some caseworker butt. But there's a point at which it goes so far on the continuum that it becomes rage. So what? They destroyed my family. That is terribly traumatic for that child. That's what I've been trying to tell you. That's a big deal. Give yourself a little time. Give yourself a break. Why can't I just go back to my family? Because when your family's gone, they're gone. You know what, Dr. Phil? This isn't going anywhere. I don't want to talk anymore. This is the time that everything can come bubbling up. Just shut up, okay? And I'm going to get on that soapbox every chance I get him. He's not even listening to me. You know, one of the things we have to do in our society is protect our children. See what I mean, people? I'm not being protected. I was stolen. When children are taken away from a parent, I mean, just like that. It destroys lives. We'll see you next time.
I had a chance to sit down with Julie Wibble today of Grand Rapids. She was another relative that was denied adoption by Bethany Christian Services. Let's go to that interview. There's a lot of cases that we bring to you each week um, in regards to um, child custody cases and a lot of these cases are very hard to watch but we appreciate you taking the time to come and listen to these parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents cases and their stories. This week's story is about four children and we have an aunt who's been fighting for custody for these children. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Julie Weibel. Well, first of all, can you tell me a little bit about your background and what um, brought you to where you're at right now and how it started? Well, in March of 2013, my brother's children were removed from their home. Um, they were staying with his ex at the time, and uh, my brother tried to get custody of them but did not really stand a chance. He really wasn't in a position to be able to do that. So him and I both talked and figured the best plan of action would be to, for him and his children to come stay with me. Unfortunately, uh, that was not agreed on by Bethany, who decided to place them in a foster home instead. Now by Bethany, you mean Bethany Christian Services? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I just want to make that clear for anybody who may not know, right. you know, exactly what we're talking about. Yep. Um, they chose to place them in a foster home and um, told me that I had to receive a foster license in order to be of any assistance to the children. Now I know that wasn't true. Now I know that I could have had the children placed with me and then worked on my foster license. But at the time, never going through anything like this before, I had no idea. Right. And that's, and that's very common is that when you know, people jump into cases like this. They're, we're not social workers. We're not um, the type of people that have worked in this field or done, had anything to do with the foster system in most cases. So that's not uncommon that you didn't know what you were doing. And unfortunately, sometimes the people that we trust are not necessarily the type of people that are always going to be honest with you. I just wanted to ask a little bit about your history and your employment. And I work at a school. Um, we have over 800 children that go to this school. Um, I have three employees under me. We are in charge of all the maintenance and all the custodial at the school. Okay. In charge of uh, locking up, making sure everything's secure. Um, I'm also with the U.S. military. Um, I'm getting ready to retire. Uh, I did this because with the kids I didn't want to take the chance on being deployed overseas and leaving them with nobody here, even though my sister has also showed support for these children. Um, and she was never even given a case study, so that was really amazing also. Well, on behalf of everybody, from Silent Voices, I think I can speak for um, Dennis, our producer, and myself. We really appreciate you, you know, standing up and working in the military to protect all of our freedoms that we're supposed to have through the American judicial system. And we thank you for your service in that. Well, thank you. So you were entrusted to help all Americans, you know, for their freedoms. And it seems that they, you know, they had told you that you needed to get your foster license. It's my understanding in just the brief conversation that we had that you did, as a matter of fact, get your foster license? Yes, ma'am. Um, I received it in January of 2014. Um, January of 2014. 
um, no problems for up to four children. The license was specifically for Kaylee, Trenton, Nicholas, and Ethan. Okay. <clears throat> now, just a quick question. While these children were in your um, brother's and your, your um, brother's, uh, the, the children's mother, was there any diagnoses that you know of, any mental health issues with these children, any learning disabilities that you can think of or that? No, ma'am. Um, they were behind in school due to the fact that they weren't getting there the way they should have been. But um, I don't believe that, the, I believe the only thing wrong with these children is the trauma of being moved around from foster home to foster home in two of the children's cases. And in the third one, or in the other two children, being taken away from everybody and everything that they know, the schools, the people, everything, just having their whole lives just turned upside down. And what, it, they denied you gaining the children despite the fact that you went through the, the classes or whatever it takes to be a foster parent, you did what they wanted to do. I wanted to ask about um, what was their reason that they denied you in taking care of these children? One, they said I didn't understand the special needs of the children. Um, and, and who was the one that diagnosed these children with special needs? I don't know. They pretty much kept us out of the loop as far as anything that we asked for, medical or school-wise. Um, towards the end, we finally received one report card, but they're really not keeping family in the loop at all. They just leave us in the dark. And it's my understanding that Kaylee was diagnosed with um, cognitive impairment. Yes, ma'am. And who was the person that diagnosed her? Um, I believe that you said that was a school counselor, somebody at the school. I believe so. Uh, again, they are keeping us out of the loop, but they don't seem to tell us much. Okay. So. It's my understanding that schools have um, guidance counselors and that type of thing, but they do not have, um, generally they do not have psychiatrists on staff to be able to diagnose children. Um, that's not something they, you know, most parents recognize that they don't do that. And, and that would be another, not to interrupt Maria, but mm -hmm. that's another fact is um, all these recommendations are coming from a therapist um, who is seeing all four children and the foster mother at the same time every other week for approximately an hour to an hour and a half. Her recommendations are coming from information given to her from the foster mother who is a competing party in the adoption. Mm -hmm. So therefore all information is totally biased. Mm -hmm. But yet this is what the recommendation that Bethany is going on. No family member has ever had a chance to talk to this, this therapist or to tell her anything that was before placement in foster care. Now, have you, have you attempted to contact this, this worker that's working with the children? I had asked about it from one of the caseworkers, and they basically blew it off. So they would not allow you access to this. I'm not going to the person who was. They just didn't make it easy. They didn't make anything easy. Okay. Now I also understand that the children are on. They have different diagnoses, including ADHD and um, the cognitive impairment and. The other two children, basically, it was stated that they just have special needs, but that was not, they didn't elaborate on the fact of what them special needs were. And I also understand that the, the foster mother created a menu for the children. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what their reasonings were? Um, they put them on very strict diets um, to include things like no potatoes, no corn, no processed foods such as macaroni and cheese, hot dogs, bologna, things that all kids eat. Um, I requested 
a recommendation from a doctor showing why they would be on such a diet. These children are all very thin. They've been, um, they weren't taken out of the home because they were abused. They were taken out of the home because of poverty. So they have gone without food on numerous occasions. Why would there be such a strict diet restricting them from foods that they love so much? And when I requested a doctor's note, all of a sudden my weekend visit became a supervised visit um, during work hours and basically, I was just basically cut off. Okay. But can you verify that it was, in fact, the, the foster mother that you were competing with that created this dietary plan and not a physician? From, I mean, in, from your knowledge, from what you know of it. From a conversation that I had with the foster mother at one time, she had stated that she researched this on the Internet and that she found certain foods to be bad. So it was all on the internet. It's my belief you can find anything that you want on the internet if you look hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, it, you know, different parents, you know, feed children differently. You've got different cultures. You've, I mean, there's, there's a whole number of things. If dietary was an issue to take children away, many people would not have children whatsoever. And the state could just diagnose them special needs and that would be it. <clears throat> so along with the diet, is there anything else that you wanted to let the viewers know about your case and what uh, you work with children, so clearly there's the, it's not the situation where you're not able to be around or take care of children. I assume if you had had abuse or neglect charges, they would not let you work at a school. I mean, that's just common sense. Right. Um, I've been around children all my life. Um, I myself was a foster child. I, I feel that I can relate to children in a way that I have a nine-year-old daughter. And during my home study, one of the questions to her during her interview was, how do you get punished, mm -hmm. you know? And she looked down and she thought about it and she says, I don't. And the lady says, well, haven't you ever been put in time out? And she's like, no. And she looked at me and I, I thought about it for a minute and I thought, she's never needed it. I yeah. have this perfect little daughter, but it's, it's, we have this, this uh, understanding between us and we relate. I talk to her, mm -hmm. you know, and we understand each other. I think that comes from being a foster child and knowing some of the trauma that goes with it and how it feels and feeling alone. Um, I also have a secret clearance through the government. Um, I've been with the military over 27 years, I have over 25 decorations, served in three wars. And, you know, it was interesting that you said about freedoms. We did go over there, and we did fight for freedom. And then I feel like I came back here, and we're still fighting the fight. And this is a fight that should have been won a long time ago. You know, I feel like there's, there's something wrong here. It's, it's broken. And if this was not happening to me, myself, I would ask the person, what are you leaving out? What are you, what are you not telling me? Yeah. Because CPS does not just come in and take your children without a reason. They don't just not give you children for a reason. They always try and keep them with family. What are you not telling me? What is there in your record that you didn't show me? Yeah. But you know what? <clears throat> I'm right here. I'm an open book. What you see is what you get. Everything that I've said is factual. And yet, Bethany sees it best to place these children with strangers, giving up their heritage, their past, starting them over, even their name. But you know, you give me six months with these children, I bet you they won't even ask about these foster parents anymore. But you give these foster parents 10 years with these children, and I'll bet you they will still ask about their family. Right. I think it's very important for family to stay together as much as possible. And according to the law, that is supposed to happen. They are show, supposed to show preference. That never happened. They broke the law.
by not doing, they did not follow policies, they did not follow procedures, and now we're at, at a state where we're competing parties with strangers. Oh, what's wrong with this? If we speed on the highway, we get a ticket. I've asked attorneys, okay, they broke the law, and they agree with me. I said, okay, what can I do? Nothing. Yeah. How come we can't do nothing? <clears throat> How come people can get away with breaking the law and nothing changes? Well, one thing that you can do is what you're doing right now, and that's speaking out, because I, I, I totally can connect with you on that point that when you tell stories like these and when you've lived in such horror, you know, I always had when I would tell people what was going on with my personal case, um, which is how I got into doing what I'm doing, I had a disclaimer that I, was, I would always make. And I would say, you know, basically somewhere in the story, I know how completely insane this sounds, you know, but this is the way it is. And that's, it, that's totally true. I would not have believed myself you know, 15 years ago, either if I met myself, you know, later right. in life. It's just not, it's not what we see our, um, especially our country doing to children. You know, this is the most important assets that we have. This is our future. Now, just one question I have for you. If you could say something to a worker at Bethany Christian Services, what would you tell them? If you could say something and know that they were going to be totally unbiased and listen, really listen to what you had to say, what would be your words for them? <laughs> That's a hard question. It's a very hard question. Because, you know, I, I don't think anything that I say to Bethany will matter. Because they told me I needed a bigger car. I went out and bought a bigger car. They told me third shift wasn't good enough. I went and got a different job. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter what I say. Doesn't matter who I am. It seems they make up their mind, and that's what they go with. Yeah. I don't think anything that I could say to them could matter. Just another quick question, you know, and I know this is, I know this is probably going to be one of the most difficult ones, but what have the children said to you in regards to them being placed with, you know, strangers rather than being placed with you? There's been a few things. Um, the last visit that I had before they decided to go supervise visits, um, Trenton didn't even want to get in the car. I literally had to go over. He was over under the tree. And I'm like, come on, you, you know you miss your, your foster mom. And he actually got angry at me and said, no, I don't. And um, he snapped at me another time when I told him it was time to go and said, I hate these short visits, like he wanted more. He didn't want to leave. Um, not once did these kids ask about the foster parents. And yet there's this bond with the foster parents. Um, just Kaylee said that she hoped that she would be able to live with me, which I did a double take because I had no idea if right. anybody, I was not allowed to talk with them concerning adoption or where they were staying or their parents. I couldn't say anything to them at all. In fact, I was told what to say to them about their parents, that their parents didn't do their homework so they were in time out. That's what they were told wow. about their parents. So they're telling children that their parents are in time out, really? That's what they're telling them. That's, that doesn't, I worked in the mental health field for a lot of years, and that does not sound healthy at all to tell a child. Um, there's other things, too, like Trent and Kaylee, the oldest ones, they're telling them they have to go to the bathroom every 30 minutes because they're saying they're not potty trained. They're looking at this like a punishment now. You know, they're feeling, um, what's the word, humiliated and embarrassed because they're being treated like the younger kids. Right. So we make pinky promises that I won't have an accident if you don't make me do this. They've never had an accident at my house, and yet this was one of the recommendations that I did not follow because I will not humiliate them like that. And I told them, if you have an accident, 
we will have to follow this. But as long as you don't, we'll be fine. You know, no accident, no problem. But I'm not a psychiatrist, and I'm not saying that she was wrong. But these kids were potty trained when they went into this foster care. All but one. And they're having issues now. Yes. And, and that can be, and that be. we're coming up to Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I just have to, um, you know, state that because that's something that I do, you know, that I take really seriously because I was a victim of domestic violence. Um, trauma can cause children to revert back to previous behaviors. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us, I'm really sorry Thank you. for what you've been through. And we appreciate you coming on the show. And this is, you know, this is how we're going to do it, by letting people know what's going on and what's taking place. Well, I appreciate you having me. And if this helped any one person, it's worth it. Yeah. Before we close, I just wanted to introduce one more guest that we have. I, I strongly believe that the people the ones who are being left out in a situation like these um, are the children. And they're the ones that are impacted, I think, probably the most out of everybody. So welcome, Chloe. Come on over. This is Chloe. And she is the cousin to the children we've been talking about. She has not been here for the entire interview, but she would like to state a few words. Hi. Hi. What would you like to say, Chloe? I miss my cousins. You miss your cousins? Mm -hmm. And what did you used to do with your cousins? Well, with Kaylee, I used to play Barbies with her. And with the boys, I played Matchbox cards. You did? That sounds so fun. Mm -hmm. Can you tell everybody how it feels that you don't get to see them? It feels bad. Because my other sister... Sisters, they're all grown up, and I don't get to play with them. If you could say anything to your cousins, look at that camera right there. What would you say to them? I really miss them, and I really love them. Well, thank you, Chloe. I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice makes, makes the, the difference. difference.